So you can use other people's borrowed interest. So if you've got credibility with, with you, if I've got credibility with you, then you're confident in our relationship and That's my right. knowledge and my ability to introduce them to somebody else. So you basically leverage, 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 and leverage. Yep. Okay, welcome back to Exploring Growth and to our CEO series where I'm interviewing, interviewing CEOs around the Central Florida area. Uh, today, I'm taking in a small sidestep in this series to talk with someone who has worked with and is connected with many CEOs. Um, my guest today is Dick Batchelor, founder and president of Dick Batchelor Management Group. Welcome to the show, Dick. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, you know, during my search for CEOs, I, I came across some of your content and was super intrigued. Um, after a, a little digging, I found that you're really well versed in um, business development and also being connected. Mm -hmm. uh, so I immediately wanted to have you on to talk about building a network and all things business development. So I thought maybe what we could do is start by um, you just kind of giving us a quick summary of your background. So we have a little context to our conversation. Okay, well, I grew up in Orlando since I was 10 years old, went away to Vietnam and with the Marine Corps, came back, went to Valencia Junior College at the time, mm -hmm. then FTU, now UCF, got involved in campus politics, actually. So that's where I started building my database from okay. thinking I wanted to run for office one day. And when I was 26 years old, I ran and was elected as one of the youngest members of the Florida House of Representatives. So that uh, database there was different than the one I created later, later which is really now want to go into free enterprise and competition and business. So I started building other databases. So that's that's kind of a summary of the public sector and then the private sector. Okay, that's great. Um, what made you think that you wanted to go into office when you were so young? Well, I got back from Vietnam and the Vietnam War, of course, uh, was still going on and uh, I was changing my mind about that and decided I would get involved in politics. And and uh, it was a surprise to everybody because I had not even thought about going to college. Frankly, we grew up very poor and it was never discussed in the household, mm -hmm. not because we were poor, but it was just never discussed in the household. Sure. And when I got back in, in, in college and started looking at different you know, philosophies and thoughts and patterns and and really, I said, you know, I'd like to be in a position of, to help people out. So I figured uh, politics was a political tool to get things done. Uh, at least it used to be, <laughs> less so today. But it was a way to get things done. So I, I really wanted to do it. I lobbied for, uh, I actually borrowed a car, went to Tallahassee and lobbied for the 18-year-old vote. I also volunteered to lobby for the uh Prisoner of War and Missing in Action of Wives. Mm -hmm. So that, that's got, that got me very excited about public policy. So that's why I really got involved very early and got elected very early and spent four terms in the legislature. So, I mean, you have no background in the things that you mentioned that you did right mm -hmm. out of the gate. No, so not at all. What, what gave you the, other than just sheer gumption, yeah. what gave you the direction to know what you needed to do? So I mentioned I thought politics was a tool, but you know, the funny thing about it is talk about databases and yeah. business development. I'm going to put it in the political arena for a minute. Uh, back then, the only way you could communicate with somebody was write them a letter or call them on their phone. Long before even fax came out, fax weren't available until 1983, I don't think. But I, I started meeting people and saying, well, if I ever decided to run for something, would you support me? And they said, yeah. So I'd write down her name and address and phone number, and I had a little 10 three by five card box, and I would collect names and telephone numbers and how to reach these people. And now if you leap forward in all these years in the private sector, now that database is now 10,000 names of people I've accumulated over the years, some in the political sector, but most in the business sector. Now, so this was just a natural kind of, you know, part of who you were to, to think in terms of having a database. Cause I know when I was that age, I didn't think <laughs> in terms of, Hey, I should be keeping track of the people yeah. that I know. Yeah. Well, uh, should we admit that maybe we were first collecting telephone numbers of women and, and they did <laughs> yeah, change, sure. change into a database, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but, but back then, yeah, because again, the only way you had to communicate was either in person by phone or, or a letter. So you needed you needed a database. Now it's it's not leap forward. You can't put it on LinkedIn or Facebook or X, Twitter. Right. You know you didn't have any of those social media tools, of course, back then. So it was a way if you if you're going to and, and uh, back then, 
uh, volunteers and like campaigns uh, were more important than even campaign contributions. And of course, there was no social media at the time. A very few people could afford TV or radio commercials when they ran. So we uh, we built a database, and from that database, when I would ask people to help me walk precincts and knock on doors, going door to door in that campaign literature, I could turn out 100 volunteers every day. So that that was really that really obviously the data pace gave me the opportunity to build to build on those contacts and uh, political development rather than business development but uh, sure. sort of the purpose of having those volunteers uh were is uh as important as having co- campaign contributions and i was known for getting people out in fact before i ran for office i actually worked in hubert humphrey's presidential campaign and was so well known for turning out volunteers that I became the assistant campaign director for the entire state of Florida at 24 because I had this reputation of really turning out a lot of young people to work on campaigns and mm-hmm. later on I got some part of reputation raising money but back then it was just raising volunteers sure yeah well I you know I don't want it to I don't want to belabor it but I also don't want it to be missed that it's such an, a, a critical component to your success is just this way of thinking that I'm going to retain these, uh, you know, back then it wasn't emails, but phone and, and names and addresses of these people that Mm -hmm. I've talked to and and connected with. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's such a fundamental uh, piece of success in building a network and, Mm -hmm. and, and then later on business development. Mm -hmm. And probably I'm, I'm asking you, you know, you're, you start out with this, this kind of direction of going in the political space, but you probably, ran against and, um, you know, rub, rub shoulders with lots of business leaders. So that's probably, is that, is that where you started to build that yeah. um, private database? Yeah. And when I uh, got out of the legislature, actually I ran for Congress at the age of 36. I thought I was uh, really needed to do something with my life. So I ran for Congress and lost that race <laughs> and then immediately went to work in the private sector. And my very first job was business development director for, for a, a copier company, Delta Business Systems in Orlando. Okay. And then uh, uh, somebody I met uh, during the campaign called me and they were r- running Vistana Resort, a very uh, successful timeshare company that later stole the Sarwood for $600 million. And they said, look, we know that you're well connected. We don't know exactly what we, we want you to do for us, but we want to hire you. So I said, well, yeah. if you want to just pay me until you figure out what you want me to do, that's fine too. Yeah. But the business, idea. what I did, it was all, it was all, that's when I lived off the Rolodex. I still call it the Rolodex today. Yeah. And that's when, okay, they wanted, uh, they wanted a public relations firm. Well, I called my friends at Curly and Penn, had them hired. Okay. Basically what I would do is I'd say, okay, uh, you need a lobbyist in Tallahassee. Let me go to my Rolodex. I know a number of them, but the best person I think for this job is this person. I'd pre-qualify them, have them interview, they would hire. So basically in the, going right into the private sector, a lot of people, frankly, should say a lot, a good number of people who leave the legislature say they want to become lobbyists. There's a two year hiatus where you can't lobby, but after the two years, some want to go back and quote lobby. I did a little bit of that. I did not like it. did not want to do it. did not want to go to Tallahassee. did not want to meet with legislators, some of whom had absolutely no influence whatsoever. Mm-hmm. I'm a time motion management nut. I'm a time motion management nut. So I'll be one. I got to drive up there. I got to meet with you. The meeting might be worthwhile, not worthwhile. So basically I said, the skill set that you had, to be able to reach out and coalesce around issues, convene people together. Uh, how can you apply that? You do not, we're not being a lobbyist, to get out of that political arena, but it's the same skill set to be able to have the Rolodex, again, the database, be able to reach out, pre-qualify people in your database who can help you on A, B, C, and D. So now, it's, you know, now I have firms like I've had Vent Health, Amscot, Colonial Life Insurance, which is a large corporation. I've got all these clients that I do business development for. And as an example, if I might use an example, this morning I was on a conference call with Colonial Life Insurance that provides supplemental benefits. So we were able to get them in every agency. So every state employee uh, would have the option for these supplemental benefits. And it's quite lucrative business. But this morning we had a phone call to say, well, do you know anybody in 
in the uh, public school system in Osceola County. I said, well, I just met at a luncheon the other day, uh, the superintendent of schools. It was at a, a, a luncheon that I had gone to. And so now I know the superintendent of schools. I knew other people under him, but I know the superintendent now. I can reach out to him. Also on the same panel was the superintendent for Orange County, Lake County, and Seminole County. Do we need to reach out to them? Because I went up and introduced myself, so I would know those people. So now they're in my database. So now I can reach out on behalf of a client and say, Colonial Life Insurance, in this case, would like to do business with you. May I set up a meeting with yourself or your HR director or benefits administrator, whomever it might be. But again, and I collect, in fact, I ask people, may I have your card? May I have your card? May I have your card? For those that still carry cards or digitally, may I have your card? Sure. And they go into the database. So, you know, it sounds like with the Osceola superintendent connection, that's very serendipitous in terms of timing. How do you think about what, which rooms to put yourself in and when? Because, Good question. you know, I mean, it, 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 timing is a big part of this, but you have to be in the right rooms, I'm sure. Yeah, and I want to go, and I know we'll talk about it later, the cultivation of personal relationships. And everybody's like on, you know, LinkedIn and X, mm -hmm. Twitter and uh, Facebook or whatever. And people are, will, will sell you a list and you can reach out to these people. But it's a kind of benign clinical uh, outreach. Then they don't really know you. It's a lot That's easier right. to state in the obvious. It's easier to reach out to somebody who you do if you've just met them. So I was always involved in the, the, the Chamber of Commerce. Of course, you do meet a lot of people through the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I was on the board of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, which by, uh, by uh, virtually is the largest Chamber of Commerce in Central Florida today. Okay. Uh, I uh, was heavily involved in my politics and engaging with the African-American communities. I went on to become the chairman of the Urban League chapter in Orlando. The Urban League is the second oldest black organization in the country. So I reach, was able to reach across a lot of aisles, right? That's right. So, so having this kind of, and now I just got a call from somebody yesterday. Well, I need to meet. This is what I do. I met you when I was on the board of the Hispanic Chamber. Conversely, if somebody wants to market to the Hispanic communities, I always say you need to go to their CEO. She's brilliant, and she puts on a lot of programs for the Hispanic business communities. And I say that in plural intentionally. Mm -hmm. So those, so being up, it's one thing to send a blind email, let's say, or a LinkedIn to Gabby, the president of the Hispanic Chamber. It's another thing for me to serve on the board and pick up the phone and call her yes. and get the references. Because you build credibility. Let me just focus on that for a moment. It's just not the contact. What's your credibility level? Do you have yes. political, do you have currency with this person that you've talked to? Yes, I do remember. Maybe. Yes, I remember the conversation. Yes, I thought that was very interesting that you brought that up. You know, that gives you some credibility rather than, hey, I saw you at a barbecue the other night. Can I do business with you? Well, you've got to cultivate that relationship, in my opinion. Still, a lot of like, I mean, you know, mass companies, you know, Apple and others yeah. do it differently than that. But still, I ran into a guy the other day. He says, I've got a great job with IBM. I said, People are actually still out there representing IPM selling, but you got to be able to open those doors. And uh, so that's, that's right. what I do on behalf of my clients, open doors for my clients. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, when you're talking about credibility, um, the way I think about it is levels of trust. And uh, what I tell my clients is, you know, you have to you have to open the door to building trust. And and that can be a place where they learn about you and you learn about them. And it could be in various different platforms, various different mediums. It could be at a at an actual in-person meeting. It could be on LinkedIn. However you make those first initial connections mm -hmm. uh, matters because um, what you want to do then is get them connected with you. Um, but, but like you're both going in the same direction. So you serving on a board is a good example of that. You're taking mm -hmm. that next step to say, mm -hmm. hey, I'm committed, which takes a lot of your time and energy. And mm -hmm. um, you, know, you only have so much time to, to hand out around. Yeah. Uh, and then lastly would be for them to be connected to you. So you, when you make a call to someone mm -hmm. and you involve them in a project or they call you and involve you in something, now you're both actively working together on something um, in parallel. 
Yeah. And, there's, um, it, it, there's one thing I, I want to add to that, and it, it's sure. called, you got the credibility, and it's what I call earned credibility. It's just not, yes. hi, how are you? Nice to see you. It's earned credibility. That's right. Uh, but then you have what I call currency. Yes. You know, have you earned currency with that person? Uh, to in, to engage beyond just a beyond just a benign conversation, right? So, what is your currency? I'm gonna give you an example. Yeah. And uh, it's um, I'm gonna give you two examples. I, I do some work in the mergers and acquisition space, and um, I not only so I went to work for an M and A company, their client of mine, and I I've got a great relationship with them, which means they pay well. <laughs> But I also uh, get a, a proportion of any fee on any business they sold. Well, I just bought a business that they, a guy I had met. Politically, we we're like extremes, right? Left and right. Yeah. Uh, extremes. But we worked together on the opioid crisis, and he made a contribution to our efforts on the fentanyl, the overdose crisis. And we talked uh, one day, and he goes, I might sell one of, one of my businesses. Long story short, because of my credibility with him, I introduced him to a mergers and acquisition firm. They just sold one small piece of the business for $12 million. So that relationship earned me several thousand dollars. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting. One time I'm in a golf cart parade in Winter Garden. In Winter Garden, it's religious requirement. You have to own a golf cart and you have to be in the golf cart parade. It just, you just have to do that. Yes. So I met a guy two years ago and his name was familiar. And I said, well, you're, family owned car dealerships here. Yeah, we started engaging talking. He goes, I know who you are. I've read about some of the things you've done in the community and all. So we just started talking and chatting. What are you doing? And I got this company and he goes, I'm thinking about selling the company. I said, let me tell you about mergers and acquisitions. <laughs> we have his contract and we have his company that would be in a contract for $30 million. A lot of that, just as an example, my fee will be several thousand dollars, but right. the, the point I was trying to make, I established a relationship. I established political currency with him, mm -hmm. not political currency, business currency. Let me call that right. that with him. And then he goes, yeah, I'll hire your company to sell my company. That's right. So I, I use those as examples. Another one's I brought in an $80 million healthcare company in Tennessee through a friend of mine. I use those examples because it can also be one step removed. And the point I'll leave you with on this point anyway, is that it could also, you can use somebody else borrows the interest. Mm -hmm. For instance, I wanted to get into a healthcare company that's probably worth $80 million. I called a friend of mine who was acting COO for a while, their consultant to grow their business. He got us in there in Tennessee today, hopefully closing the deal. So you can use other people's borrowed interest. So if you've got credibility with you, if I've got credibility with you, then you're confident in our relationship and That's my right. knowledge and my ability to introduce them to somebody else. So you basically leverage, 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 and leverage. Yep. That's what I call transferred cre credibility. Right. For sure. And that's that's really, I think, how a lot of people uh, are able to stay in business is where they get ref what you call referrals. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, hey, you know, I know you worked with so-and-so, so, -and -so, so mm -hmm. I trust that person, so I trust you. And so that, mm -hmm. that trust gap is closed much quicker. Uh, than it would be on your own merit or, or earning it uh, typically. Um, but, you know, you can't always get transferred every single time. So that's where you have to put in the work to to earn it over time. Uh, so well, I, love know, that. I love that model. I'm sorry. And uh, I, I know that you consult, which is a, a great attribute because uh, I, I'm just surprised about how many almost not entirely young people, but young people who they've got, they don't have a business plan. I'm going to start this business. I'm going to have a website and, and the world's going to come money to me. Well, good luck. <laughs> good yeah. luck. You know, you, you might be back to the Henry Ford days. We have, uh, you can have any color you want as long as it's black, right? That's, that's, all, right. <laughs> that's all you can have. That's the color, color you can have. Yeah. But it's just amazes me about how many people go out there and they don't, you can create a company. Let's say you're selling widgets. But you, get, but you better, if you don't know what your customer base is, mm -hmm. if you don't know what they want, you better not be starting a business. Because That's the right. only reason I know to start a business, if you want to be, somebody asked me one time, I do so much volunteer work, is they said, are you not for profit? I said, not intentionally. I am not intentionally not for profit. But, you know, I was just amazed how many people want to start a business and because they think, they think 
there's something out there that they, yeah. they have a widget that everybody wants. It's like watching Shark Tank, and sometimes you go, "This brilliant idea," and sometimes you go, "Where have you sure. been?" Yeah, who's gonna who's gonna buy that? Where have you been? That's right. Yeah. Well, let's zoom back out for a minute, talking about this uh, building a network um, topic. How, if you know, if you're talking to a CEO specifically, or or business leader of some sort, executive suite, and they're thinking about um, you know growing their network for various reasons, but one for business development mainly. Um, what kind of people should they be thinking about putting in their network? Because that's going to determine yeah. the rooms that they're in. Yep. Uh, over the overarching word would be leadership. Uh, for instance, I have a client uh, who wanted to be involved and really was willing to give the time, energy, and some money. And so I, as an alumnus, I'm an alumnus of Leadership Florida. Okay. statewide or leadership organization. So I nominated her. She had accepted it. She just loves, she wouldn't believe the contacts it makes. In fact, so I just happen to have on my desk here, I'm not selling this, it's the membership directory of Leadership Florida. I can go through this book and look at every member of Leadership Florida. Everybody's ever gone through it, their name, address, the corporation that they worked for. And there have been times, one time I needed to get in a Baptist hospital in Fort Lauderdale. I go to my book, and here's the vice president of Baptist hospital in Fort Lauderdale. Pick up, hey, we have something in common. We're both alumni of Leadership Florida. I'm not done. Just do it. So that's the credibility. That's the enhanced that's credibility. Right. But it's kind of, you know, get back to the barred interest. Can you use somebody else's credibility to get in? So I would say, Get in, in leadership, uh, whether it's a chamber of commerce, mm -hmm. Hispanic chamber, African American chamber, Asian chamber, uh, but get involved where people gather. And there's still actually, believe it or not, active Rotary clubs where have 100 to 200 members come to these Rotary club meetings or service organization. That's kind of the old model, but it works. There's a lot of very influential people who go to those Rotary club meetings. But uh, circuits are, you know, you've got to go where. The influence is, and that's really organizations. Uh, as another example, uh, a client wanted to be involved in the community, but just to give back, understanding that just giving back sometimes, ex oftentimes, exposes you to people who you might do business with. Well, she went on to become the chairman of the cardiovascular board at Advent Health. Okay. And another one who went on, I chaired the foundation board there 16 years and yep. I was retired from that and recommended somebody else. So being there on the cardiovascular board at Bent Health is an example. It could be Orlando Health. It could be the Morris Children's Hospital. Right, right. But given, be willing to give back. Be willing, I'm glad we got on this. Side. Be willing to give back to the community. Mm -hmm. Reciprocate. You know, you know get on... Uh, you know, Boys and Girls Club, you know, board of directors. Uh, and you give back, but by the same token, if you ever go online and look at the board members or the Boys and Girls Club, it's very influential. Mm -hmm. Junior achievements, very influential. So there are ways to get involved in a community that reciprocates you. Not it's not only like an intentional thing. You want to you want to be of service to the community, science center board, whatever it might be. Right. But I would say business organizations a specific chamber and get involved in a not-for-profit community. But the last thing I would tell you though, when people come to me and say, I want to be involved in a not-for-profit. I want to be involved in an issue. The first question I have, and the only one I have, what's your, what's your passion? Mm -hmm. Because if your passion is cardiovascular and I want to put you on the children's board or the cancer board, you're not going to be effective or an effective member quality quality member so whatever your your fashion you come to me and say i have a passion for almost a multitude of anything i can say okay you need to join this organization you need to join it and by the way that's part of the business development for corporation you want your clients involved in the community mm -hmm. uh, because they want to give back to the community but they start building their reputation as a giver in the community so right. you you definitely want that not-for-profit uh volunteer uh, uh, element in your uh, strategy for business development. So how, how, you know, if you're a CEO, 
you you know obviously you only have so much time you're running a company you're mm -hmm. putting fires out every day right. how do you fit these activities and this you know taking your passion to boards and and organizations how do you fit that into your day and into the i, I assume it's more of a long term you know type of thinking mm -hmm. it's not a short term you know effect but how does the ceo fit it in the good the good news is a lot of the uh, big organizations I think Junior Achievement might be one example, which is a great organization of business people. And, uh, but they might only meet quarterly. In okay. fact, one of the first questions I used to ask when you asked me to be in your board, I said, if you meet monthly, I'm not coming. <laughs> <laughs> if you meet at eight o'clock in the morning, I'm still not coming. But, yeah. uh, but you know, a, a major CEO of a, CEO of a small company, they're busy, 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 they're building the business. Yeah. If they could do quarterly meet. Another thing, if you're a major corporation, Sign, find a vice president or somebody at the senior management level who has a passion about Alzheimer's or whatever it might be and let them go because they don't have the passion for it. They'll yeah, represent like your company as well as you might in your absence. So you can always delegate that uh, as part, but find somebody who has a passion for it. Don't just assign somebody because that's their job. Yeah. Yeah. I like that idea of sort of deploying value high value people in your organization mm -hmm. you know that's another good way to um, build a robust culture internally as well because mm -hmm. uh, there's more to talk about there's more things that are happening more connections being made and people are doing it based on their passion so i really like that idea one of the groups locally uh, with him i've dealt with, very impressed with is called go sherm i don't know if you know sherm the mm -hmm. society for human resource human management resources, right and they're the HR directors and benefits administrator for corporations. Mm -hmm. And the Go Sherm chapter, which is the name of the local chapter, has over 650 members. And so we brought them in on our opioid fight because they could actually uh, put together a program. We could help them, an educational component. They get it accredited. So anybody from Sherm who comes to this opioid crisis uh, meeting mm -hmm. can get credits. Uh, for the towards our required accreditation and they drive like 150 people so it's a uh, if you're in the hr sector the being a member of sherm is a great organization too because they really are involved in the community and they represent all the major corporations in town yeah and i'm sure you can find an organization like that uh, mm -hmm. by discipline um, yes so, so earlier you mentioned um, this this example of needing to get in touch with someone at a certain organization, you had a uh, you know a database or a book that you went to, and you, you were able to find who you need and use that sort of social credibility that you had as part of being the organization. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a good example of kind of a surface level connect mm -hmm. and one that doesn't require a lot of um, social equity or cap capital to to do it. Right. Um, there are, I'm sure there's a lot like the M&A examples and some other things that require more deep trust. Um, how do you keep, like, do you have a system that you use to keep in touch with people so that you can keep some of those high level relationships fresh? Um, no, I, I don't. It, it's it's kind of naturally. I end up at different events um, of where some of the same people are on a regular basis. So I, cultivated that way but i stay in touch and a lot of these people are really are friends in addition to being business acquaintances so i do see them socially too uh i just had lunch today i won't disclose his name but a, a very 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 wealthy person in, in orlando we were happen to be personal friends but i brought him a deal uh, on a factoring contracting financial what I call it, exotic financing opportunity. Sure. Yeah. But but we were just catching up with each other. On what's going on here? You're involved in this not for profit in a big way in there. What's going on? And I said, oh, by the way, I had this exotic financing request and come to me. And uh, my my job is not to know a lot. My job is to know a lot of people who know a lot. Yeah. And okay. I think a lot of people have to be reminded of. You don't have to be. You don't have to saturate yourself with every element of the kind of, of the of, of knowledge but so in, in business development and in you and i'm sure in your consulting you know you don't have to know everybody and that's you right. don't have to know everything about everybody that's right but if you had the currency to be able to approach that person with some level of certainty then it, it makes a big difference so uh, it just it, it just it, now i've been doing this 
for 45 years. So sure. that's another thing I, I like. You know, a lot of young people today, the joke is, and maybe it's not a joke, it's maybe it's the truth, as I say, the first question they have when they jo- do a job interview is, when can I have your job? <laughs> and, and my response is, about 45 years from 45 now, you, years, can, you yeah. can have my job. Yeah. Can you just can you just start out today and do business development with a with a, a clean slate? Yeah, it's that's tough. Much, yeah, much more. That's the, that's because again, I think the conversation coming back around creating relationships is not a virtual exercise. It really is a personal exercise, and I'm still old school enough to believe those personal connections make a, a big difference. I really do. Now, again, social media, you know, X, Twitter, LinkedIn, I get all of that. I, I get all of that. I get it for massive marketing. But as far as having a company where you want to do business development that requires you to in, introduce your client to part of A, B, C, and D, I, I still think old school enough that those relationships where they have, you've got currency mm-hmm. and they've got confidence in your abilities make a difference. I agree a hundred percent. And I'm of the schooling that, you know, my personal experience is the one-to-one connections can, can, can be scaled. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it may not be um, exponential. It may take some time for it to be exponential, but that, that snowball starts to roll downhill pretty quickly. Yeah. And I think you've given us some good examples of uh, deals that have come through for you mm-hmm. that, you know, they, they may not have come through unless it just took, a decade of knowing those people. Mm-hmm. Well, the one thing I'd like to uh, mention, if you don't mind, is I, I've just written a book. Oh, okay, great. And, yeah. And it's available on Amazon. It's called Building Bridges in Toxic Political Times A Roadmap for Community Leaders. The reason I named it that is because it not only applies to people in the political arena, but also people in the corporate community. Mm-hmm. But the thesis of the book is basically set aside those differences, focus on something in the community. So the community can come together, but, uh, specifically the corporate community that wants to be involved in, you know, against Alzheimer's, human trafficking, domestic violence, child abuse, opioid crisis, whatever the issue is. We don't agree on that. We're not talking about that. We're convening around things that we can find a solution and come up with a plan. It's just not to convene and talk about it, but actually come up with a plan of action. And the, but the corporate leaders, uh, they're they're a major part of anything that we do. Uh, with faith community, some some politicos, the sheriff maybe, but it really the corporate community is driving this conversation around the opioid crisis. As an example, our First co-chairman was the CEO of Red Lobster. Mm-hmm. Again, I don't know what his politics is. I do not want to care what his politics is. He doesn't want to know mine. He might figure it out, but he doesn't need to know. Yeah. But w- what we knew is that as a corporate leader, bringing together corporate leaders, faith leaders, political leaders, we can convene around an issue and find a, an action plan and a solution. So mm-hmm. that's why I really want corporate leaders to look at and say, what role can I play in the community? Something from the heart, but uh, getting them involved in it's a very it's a template on how to do that. Yeah, well, that's great. We'll we'll definitely uh, drop a link to that book um, website uh, in the in the description so people can check that out. Thank you. Um, I, I think that's um, that's that's great. You know, another resource to to the conversation. Um, I like the term that you you used apolitical, and it makes me think of you know creating or being a part of this sort of third party. Um, place, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's an organization, a board of directors you're on, or um, mm-hmm. an issue that you're you're about. Um, what it does is allows, like you said, people to come together from across various aisles um, and backgrounds and com- commit to connecting in a way that they wouldn't have co- connected in business or politics mm-hmm. or faith or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that's a really important point mm-hmm. um, to to building a network and business development is finding this third party place that. You can you can arrive where everyone else is and share. Uh, and again, passion. If if everyone's kind of rowing in the right direction, you're going to end up somewhere. You know, in fact, if you t- the best example I can think of in Orlando is after Pulse, after 49 young people were murdered, all faiths came together. The political community, the corporate community, uh, the community at large, all came together to support survivors, but also to continue to recognize those whose lives were lost. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. And even in the faith community, the more conservative faith leaders set aside their differences on sexuality, let's call it LGBT, and said, hey, murder's murder. We lost human lives here. So that was the best example I've ever seen of people coming together. Yeah, and it didn't matter, Democrat, Independent, it did not matter. The politics did not matter. We focused on something that was, we needed a healing process, and we went through a healing process after Pulse. That's right. Yeah. I uh, experienced that too um, and saw that that happening with local business owners um, and uh, faith leaders and and you name it. Everyone really came together. Yeah. It was, it was yeah. really cool. Okay. Well, hey, this has been a great conversation as I knew it would. Thank you. Thank um, you. This, is, this is such a great um, topic to, to dive into and to have someone who's really done it really well over the years. Thank you. Uh, it's been really nice to have you on. So I appreciate that. Well, thank you for the courtesy. I appreciate it and I hope you're... Uh... Uh, listeners get some value out of it. How's that? Oh, for sure they will. This okay. is packed full of value. If they okay. don't get any value out of this, you need to stop listening. <laughs> Charge them double. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but Thanks. so if if people want to, we'll put the link to the book, but if people want to come and contact you personally, where should we send them? Just digbashler.com is easy. Okay. Okay. That's perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Thank again. you. We'll have to get together sometime and compare notes. Yes, let's do it. Okay, let's do it. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you.